Hello and a big welcome to this very special 5 by 15 event as we step into the mysterious world of Susanna Clark and we are so thrilled to be joined by Susanna and Neil Gaiman all the way from New Zealand for this very, very special event after our summer break with two of our most powerfully imaginative and beloved authors. So we're delighted to have many hundreds of people signed up. We've got about 650 people now live on this webinar. And please don't forget to put your questions in the Q&A box. I know that um, Neil is gonna try to come to as many of them as he can towards the end. Um, and let me introduce our speakers quickly before we get started. I know that they need very little introduction. Susanna Clark um, is the author of her debut novel, Jonathan Strange and Mr. Norrell, which was published in 2005 in more than 34 countries and was an absolute sensation, long listed for the Booker Prize. It was winner of the British Book Awards, Newcomer of the Year, the Hugo Award and the World Fantasy Award. And tonight we're here to discuss her incredible new novel, Piranesi, a New York Times and Sunday Times bestseller, and again, a book of the year for, uh, by many, many people uh, in 2020. And it's out this week in paperback from Bloomsbury Books. If you haven't already got a copy, then please do get one. And I know that New and Books will be very happy to help you. And I'll put your, their details in the chat in case you want to order from them. Neil Gaiman will be leading the conversation today, joining us all the way from New Zealand, very early for him, but thank you so much for being with us. He's an amazing friend to 5 by 15 and you may have seen him with us before. He's the award-winning author of many, many books from the New York Times bestseller lists, including Neverwhere, American Gods, The Ocean at the End of the Lane, um, the Sandman series of graphic novels. And today in paperback, he has Pirate Stew out for children uh, and Make Good Art, which he has written with Chris Riddell. So he's credited with being one of the creators of the modern graphic novel. And uh, he's an author whose work crosses genres and ages. So a special thanks, Neil, for being with us. Um, we're in awe of both of you, two fantastic authors. It's a real privilege to bring you together. And I will hand over now to Neil to um, start the conversation. Thank you so much, Daisy. Um, right. Hello, Hi, Neil. Susan. Hi. It's it lovely to so see lovely you. To, it really is. That's the, that for me is, is um, why I agreed to get up ridiculously early. So um, you're speaking to us from tomorrow, I think. I am. I, it is it is the future. I'm talking right. to you from the future. We have flying cars here. Uh, you know, it, it's it's lovely here in the future. Um, I can check out the window and the sun is starting to rise on our on a bright sounds great. day. Unfortunately, but still in lockdown here in New Zealand, but um, in lockdown in a world, in a country with basically no COVID. So I'd rather be in. Well, yes, that that does sound good actually um yes and we're we're kind of getting on with it in a country with quite a bit of covid so that's interesting too it is i and all i have learned about the last 18 months or a little bit more is that you make plans and then they change yeah. and um on the other hand, the 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 COVIDlessnessness of this um, doing doing a Zoom means that we're actually, despite being halfway across the world from each other, actually getting the chat, which is lovely. No, it it is. I, um, as someone who's been housebound for the best part of well, a lot of sixteen years. It is amazing how the world suddenly opened up when we went into lockdown because suddenly all the people I wanted to talk to were on my computer, which was just extraordinary. So it has it has been a very odd uh, year and a half. And some of my ex my experience is, has, has, as usual, been sort of the opposite of other people's. The world opened up for me when everybody when it closed down for everybody else. It's, it's been odd. Yeah. I, one of the things that fascinated me about Piranesi was how incredibly appropriate it felt for its time. Um, you know, we were in a world which for many of us suddenly turned into a house. 
yeah. um, or even a couple of rooms. And now you gave us a book, which gave us that, but it gave us that in a way that allowed us to keep moving and keep imagining. It, I can't, yeah, that was, that was very, very strange for me, the way the world sort of shifted in that way and the, the sort of uh, the way the world kind of aligned with Piranesi was very very peculiar but at the same time his experience Piranesi's experience the character is so different in the sense that his house is an infinite house and he has absolutely no sense of being imprisoned he has a sense of total freedom. At, at, towards the end of the book, someone says to him, were you free to come and go? And he says, yes, yes, I came and I went. And um, he does, he, feel, he feels in this very strange place, which he cannot leave, he feels utterly free. I think, I, I was in lockdown on Sky, on my house on the Isle of Sky when I read it. And it was, it was one of the best days I had during that whole lockdown. Um, was just, and it had been sitting there, I'd been sent a proof of it. And, um, and I'd been putting it off putting off reading it until the right day. And finally, um, it, was, it was an utterly beautiful day. Uh, it was one of those sky summer days where um, the sun never sets and it just sort of, you know, the sun finally gets around to setting about 11 o'clock at night. And by that time, it's too late to do any good. and Your day just went on forever. Um, and I, as somebody who had loved your fiction, um, and has loved your fiction since something ridiculous like 1992 or 1993, um, it, I, I entered it almost nervously going, I wonder if what she's going to be making, she hasn't done anything for a while. I've been um I, as a as a friend of yours for a ridiculously long time and a friend of your partner Colin Greenland um since I did the numbers on my fingers and keep coming up to 1983 which sounds impossible because there weren't even people alive back in 1983 yes. there were just dinosaurs and, and things um but I I I sort of followed the kind of weird seedling growth of Piranesi through occasional emails from Colin, oh. where, because he would, he would sort of send me little emails that would say things like, um, you know, the weather today continues much the same. <laughs> uh, and, uh, you know, Susanna is on the couch upstairs doing crocheting things and uh, very active in various groups and uh, is not writing anything. And then I'd get one from him saying, the weather today continues much the same, Susanna continues to crochet. I think she may be writing something, but she hasn't shown it to me yet. And then as time continued, it turned into Susanna is indeed writing. Um, and then it turned into, I have, you know, I have read it now and it is good and I hope you get to read it. So there was a sort of a lovely bubbling excitement. And when I read it, I was just so, it was the joy, I think it was the joy from the first page of knowing one is in safe hands. And that for me, I think is, is one of the best things that as a writer, you can give any reader is just that, feeling that you know what you're doing and this is going to be fine um it's lovely 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 to hear you say all those things i'm, I'm sort of remembering 
writing it and my, Colin my husband doesn't usually it, he want to read anything he likes to read it when it's finished so the first thing I did when it was finished was take it to him and say is this actually a story or am I just talking to myself you know is anyone else going to understand this because I really wasn't sure um and as you say it had been a long time but he said, yes, it's a story. You can show it to other people. But I think um, going further back, I think you, because you were one of those, the first people to read my first short story, which I wrote in the world of Jonathan Strange and Mr. Norrell, because I wrote it for, the, the story was The Ladies of Grassadure. I wrote that for a, um, creative writing week thing course which was where I met my husband and after he'd read the short story he sent it to you and I was living in Cambridge and I came in a, in a flat and I came down one morning to go to work and I got my post and there was a postcard from Neil Gaiman which you sent me and saying how much she'd love the story. And you misspelled amiable. I remember that. You said something about, I am an amiable, you wanted to say you were an amiable chap, but you'd actually mm -hmm. said aimable, which means liable to be aimed at. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, but apart from that, it was lovely. And I remember sitting down on the stairs and just crying because I was so happy. It was, um, it was, it was a lovely moment. So yes, we go we go back away, don't we? It but really before did. that, I should just tell the story. When I was before, when I was starting to write and starting to get towards what was eventually be Jonathan Strange and Mr. Norrell, but was still in the early stages. Who who knew what this was going to turn out to be? And I was reading the Sandman comics, and that uh, I read. I was living up north with my parents. Um, on the in County Durham on the coast near Peter Lee. And as a treat, occasionally I would take the bus and go into Newcastle and I would go to Waterstones. And I was so enthralled with Sandman. And I found in Waterstones in Newcastle a publisher's newsletter or something who they thought was going to be interested in this stuff I don't know but it had it was an account of a party that they'd had and there was a photograph I told you this once there was a photograph on this newsletter and I picked it up and I kept it for a long time because there was a picture of Neil Gaiman and I thought this is the guy who wrote this but the weird thing was that also in that photograph was Colin Greenland, who I'd never heard of, who I would eventually marry. There was another guy who was a publisher, Nick Webb, who I would eventually work for, but again, hadn't met at that point. And Ros Caveney was also there, who I hadn't met, never heard of, but who became a friend of mine later. So there were four people in this photograph. It was sort of like my future life laid out, but I had no idea. I don't know where that photograph is. I can't prove that this is true, but it's it's kind of weird. I, what I love most about that is it's so novelistic. Sometimes the world is novelistic. You would you would you know you've run across that photo in the first few pages of a novel, and then gradually all of us would turn up. Um, I think nobody would believe it. In a novel, it would just be too contrived. But in life, somehow, life doesn't care about that kind of stuff. Life has no desire to be convincing. It simply is. Um, I think that's actually the biggest problem that all of the all of the the people running into the problems with COVID and reality have is they keep wanting life to be convincing because obviously it wouldn't work like this in real life, and obviously it has. Um, that was, I first encountered you, I was, I recently moved to America, I was missing everything in the UK, 
and I got a letter from Colin Greenland. And I had known Colin since, I, as I say, in 1983, we met at a signing slash event for um, Brian Aldis at Forbidden Planet and um, when it was still in Denmark Street. And the event was in the pub next door, which in later years would become the Cafe Munchen and then go away. But at that time was just, I don't even remember what it was. I think it was a white lion, maybe a red lion. Um, and uh, we just met and liked each other. It was that sort of instant, oh, I like you. You're, you're amazing. Um, and Colin sent me this story and he just sent me the story saying this was, uh, this was a student of mine at a writing workshop and she's written the story and I think it's rather wonderful and uh, she's a fan of yours and I think you'll like it. And I read The Ladies of Grass of Year and it was like fireworks. It was like, oh, this is amazing. Where have you been all my life? I, I, I love this. And I loved it so much that when I got um, a, a letter from um, a, a friend of mine, Patrick Nielsen Hayden, who was an editor at Tor Books saying, did I have anything for a, uh, a fancy anthology he was putting together. I wrote to him and I said, look, I don't, but this just came in from Colin Greenland. I think you should contact the author because I think she's amazing. Um, and I sent it off to him, which must have been rather a surprise to you. I got a, I got a message on my answering phone at home from some an editor I'd never heard of um, accepting my submission for a, an anthology I'd never heard of and to which I had not submitted. So yes, it was a bit of a surprise. It was kind of like, what, what's happening at this point? It was very surreal. I, I think, uh, yes, for all of those people I'm watching going, I keep submitting the stories and not selling them. There has to be, there has to be giant cosmic balance. So you got to be the person who sold the story without even submitting it. I know, well, it was thanks to you and Colin. It was just, it was amazing, but um, yeah. Well, I, I then got to spend the best part of the next decade um, just very excited about you because I would, people would say who are your favorite writers and I would list them in interviews and then I'd, get to the end of my list and then I'd say, and there's this person never really heard of called Susanna Clark and she's written a handful of short stories and every short story you wrote, you'd send me and I get excited. I'd say, but she's working on a novel and it is gonna happen. And when the novel comes out, everybody will know about her. And I love that I was right. I, I'm not very good really normally at, at predicting the future. Um, I'm a bit crap, but I got that one right. And uh... well, if you thought it was going to be finished, and that was strange and oral, then you knew more than I did because I was sort of having every couple of years, I would sort of have a meltdown. So I can't possibly do this. I can't possibly do this. I've been working on it so long, it still isn't finished. But um, that was that was my husband. That was Colin. Just sort of. Um, I think there's this thing in couples, like when one person. It's not that one person's sort of naturally flaky and one person's calm it's just that when it's whose turn is it to be flaky and whose turn is it to be calm so like when Colin has a has a meltdown of some sort then I I sort of sit back and become very rational and he was like that with me when I was when I would have a meltdown about strange and oral he would become very rational and he would say well you need to write some more short stories because you can do that you know you can and then you can get a name out or we need to get you an agent now because that will give you more confidence all of these he would sort of suddenly become this terribly practical person which um 
He isn't always. I like the idea that especially when you have people who make art, somebody gets to be the balloon and somebody gets to be the person walking on the yes. ground holding the string yes um yes. but yes it, it can absolutely change yeah and uh the right now i've got um my wife amanda is is absolutely being the person on the ground holding the string pretty much all the time because i'm off trying to finish scripts and for television that we're shooting very soon um and it's exciting. Uh, it is it's 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 exciting and in a normal non-covid world it would just be exciting we'd be there would be a sort of fun jet set element and right now i'd be in um i'd be living with the family in edinburgh setting up to start shooting Good Omens in Bathgate and uh, Anansi Boys in Leith. And instead, I'm currently in New Zealand uh, in lockdown uh, while giant sets are being built and people are occasionally phoning up and saying, so the script for episode six, um, do you have an updated, when, when can we, uh, could you at least tell us what's going to happen in it? Because we've got to build the set. So I'm like, yes, I'm, I'm, I will tell you a little bit. You've always been, um, because you because you started in graphic novels, you have this sort of history of collaboration. And I always thought I could never do that because I have to, my imagination just, I mean, it's hard enough for me to work out what my imagination is doing. No one else, I, I kind of think I can't inflict that on anybody else. Until I got to go and see them film Jonathan Strange and Mr. Norrell, which I suppose was in 2015-ish, sort of. And I, it was just, and then I saw the wonderfulness of collaboration, because you get to see your characters walking around. And nobody, told, I never realised how exciting that would be. It's sort of like these people used to live in my head, and now they're just they're going up and down and they're carrying umbrellas and they're drinking cups of coffee. It's fantastic. I loved it. Isn't that, that there is this amazing magic to me. I get it less weirdly with, with the characters, although it's been, I've been having a lot of it recently with Sandman. Um, but I get it. I get it as an author in spaces. I'll get it with, I made this place up. I am standing in a library I invented. I am standing in a, um, in a palace, in a, in a floating airship, in whatever. And I made this place up and now I'm standing in it. And that feels so surreal. Yes, yes, yes. Yes, the ballroom at Lost Hope, I think. Get, people sort of took me and said, this is the ballroom at Lost Hope. And you think, wow. This is amazing, yeah. I, the, it, it is that, that thing when you're standing in the space. Um, I've been, it's been very weird with Sandman because I've been, you know, starting last, whatever it was, October, we've been, and it's now finished, principal photography. Uh, season one of Sandman has been shot and, um, there are sequences where I have a smug 26, 27 year old in my head going, I knew that would work. <laughs> um, and then there are moments where I find myself, you know, that there, there were definitely moments during a couple of episodes where I would realize that I was crying at oh. something that had been that a version of me had written 30 something years ago yeah. and it actually had landed here and now and I couldn't tell if I was crying because I was so relieved that it had somehow made it onto the screen in a way that was was real and here I am and I'm listening to my dialogue and I'm watching my characters and Tom See, Sturridge, 
bless him, is is Morpheus. Uh, do, I don't know how he did it. Do you not wish that you could bring that 27-year-old person and have them next to you and sort of show, look, look, it, look, it actually happened? I, I, I kind of feel yeah. that sometimes. I always want, want when I'm watching, as I quite often do, Peter Jackson, um, Peter Jackson's Lord of the Rings, I always wish I could sort of bring Tolkien and show him and say, look, the things that were in your head, now everybody can see them. I don't know whether it would, he would actually approve of them, but I think he would. <laughs> I think he would. Part of him would. I, it, it's, uh, I just put Tolkien in films. I just remember reading the letter that he wrote to Disney where they had written the outline for, um, for their Lord of the Rings movies to him. And there was a moment where the hobbits, the, the band of hobbits are sitting eating enormous sandwiches. And he wrote this entire essay on how they wouldn't eat enormous sandwiches. They would just sit and smoke their pipes. They had pipe weed. And, <laughs> and you're like, ah, yes, comical, comical giant sandwiches would not go down very well. Um, and there is, there is that tendency of filmmakers to introduce the comical giant sandwiches into our stories. In, for Piranesi, I've only ever done it once, written a something I thought was a short story, but it just kept on going for page after page. And I keep thinking it was it was my book, The Ocean at the End of the Lane. And I kept thinking, you'll be done soon, a couple of days from now, and I'll finish you. And then it was as if I was on a journey and I'd heading to a town that I thought was really close. And then I'd suddenly turn a corner and I go, oh no, I've got all of that stuff to go before I get to that town. Okay, and you're a, you're, you're a novella, you're a novelette. And the shock for me in actually doing the page count at the end, doing the word count when I typed it all up and realized that I'd actually accidentally written a novel um, was enormous and in, uh, mostly a relief because I no longer had to worry about how, how and where, what, what I was meant to do with this thing. Yeah. It, it, yeah. it had grown up enough that I could just send it to a publisher. Yeah. So Piranesi, did you think on page one you were writing a novel? I wasn't sure. I wasn't sure what it was going to be. I just knew that for somebody who was coming out of illness um, and didn't have a huge amount of energy, this looked like a manageable project. Um, and it also looked like something which, unlike Jonathan Strange and Mr. Norrell, didn't need a huge amount of research because I couldn't figure out what I would research. Um, I did try and research clouds for some reason because there are clouds in the upper stories. But that turned out to be completely irrelevant. Um, so I didn't really know how long it would be, but it, because I have, and I still have these five or six pages that I wrote when I was in my twenties, which are the thing from which it grew. And I managed to get one line in that was the same. That, that was my treat for the sort of 24 year old me that started writing yeah. this thing and didn't know where it was going. I thought I've got one of your lines in. Uh, somebody, I think the copy editor said, should we take this out? And I said, no, no, don't take that one out. That's, 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 that has a purpose. Um, but I know I didn't really know how, what sort of thing it was going to be. And one of the first readers of it was Francis Spufford, the novelist and all round wonderful writer. Memoirist, wonderful, wonderful writer. Yeah. And I said to him, it's, do you think this is a novel? And he said, he said, I think your, your earlier experiences with novels have made you think they must be 800 pages long. It's fine, fine. They don't have to be 800 pages long. So I thought, no, that's probably true. So yeah, it, but yes, there was a relief when I realized this is, this is actually 
um, this is actually a book that was wonderful. Yeah, yeah. The, it, it felt to me very much recognizable as a, the, the opening felt like something that I visited before. The, the feeling that, ah, oh, here we are, we have one entity walking around an enormous space. Um, what I loved about it, beyond that, because I loved our entity and our space, was the fact that it, if, if this story had existed in um, the 1960s, it would have been sort of new wave science fiction and would not have needed to land anywhere. Um, there's, a, there's a story by Samuel R. Delaney, Love and the Night and the Loves of Joe Costanza, which is one of those kind of it, it, stories in which it part of the feeling, part of the emotion, part of the, what you're getting out of the story is the fact that you are just in a place without rules and walking around and discover process of discovery, but this is it. You, you're exploring it in the same way that a writer would explore a blank page. And one of the things that I wasn't expecting in the way that it landed was how gloriously rational it was by the end that actually everything did feel explained. It felt like it 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 wasn't it wasn't surrealist fiction. It was actually gloriously realist fiction, and that you played very much by the rules. I hadn't really thought of Piranesi as a realist novel, but um, I have to think about that. I think it's, yeah, I, it's this idea of when you're trying to write, I do think the ideas sort of come up from the subconscious, which is why something like The Sandman works so well, because it's bizarre and there's these, in the realm of the the dream lord everything is about dreams so there's these random sort of conjunctions of things but at the same time they feel as you say a little bit um they do feel have a sort of familiarity to them the place feels a bit familiar because we all dream and that that was the sort of thing i think that i wanted for piranesi for for his house for the house this vast infinite thing where there's um progression of halls and the walls were all covered with statues and some of the statues are described and i sort of wanted them to be a bit like tarot images of tar on tarot cards where you look at something an image on a on a card and you think well i've never seen that image before it's very strange Yet at the same time because it's so archetypal because it's part of the, it's come up from the subconscious, not of a particular person, but of all humanity. It's, um, it, it has this sort of familiarity almost. And that it was that sort of combination for the house of, I've never been here before. I've never been anywhere quite like this. But at the same time, there is a sort of feeling of familiarity. And for the um, for the statues to have that that sort of impact as images, that was that was something I didn't know at the beginning that I wanted that, but I gradually realised that was that was a big part of it. I think. Are you are you a planner? To what extent do you plan in your fiction, and to what extent do you discover? No, I I, I wish I was a planner. I love the idea of being able to write down what you're going to write about um, in chapter chapter 27 or something. 
but I cannot do it. I tried so hard with Strange and Norrell because I thought I ought to do this. I ought to, this is a huge novel. I ought to be able to plan it out. But what I have is a sort of sense of the shape, I think, yeah. um, a kind of, but it's very, it is quite vague. It's just a sort of shape in my mind. And I, I kind of know this will be, you know, this bit will be sad and this bit will be, there'll be angst and drama and stuff. And then this bit will be calm. It's that kind of thing. I, I, what I try to do is, um, is sort of just write down the really striking images that have come to me. And I write and try and write those bits as they come. And then I have this curious bit of how to go back to the beginning and having to try and fit them all together. That's the difficult bit. That's a bit that doesn't really work. Um, I did, as I said, I'm not one of nature's collaborators. I did briefly, someone said, well, could, should we collaborate on this Project X? And I sort of said, here are a few ideas. And he said, great, we could have a plot like this, or maybe it should be like this. And I was thinking, plot? No, plot comes way, way further down the line. <laughs> First, we have to think of all these, these, these images and these kind of, I don't know, it's just ideas. So I, I can't really... Um, I'm not, I'm not exactly what you call a professional writer. I can't really say what things are going to be like. I can just say, well, I, I think there'll be a bit, a bit in a, a shopping centre um, where somebody hands her a cup of coffee. That's about all I know. And I think it'll come sort of in the last quarter of the book. But that, you know, you, you can't really... Um, and then trying to kind of... Who was it who said that um for hit some one writer that didn't plan he said it was like to trying to drive across a continent without any headlights and i thought that was very good it was el doctoro was it uh, was the first person i ever saw that analogy from although lots of us have nicked it including me yes. um since but it's it's like you can drive you're driving you can get a long way. You can only drive as far in front of you as you can see, but you can get all the way across a continent like that. Yeah, I don't. Um, I, I wouldn't say there are no headlights. You can see a little bit <laughs> the way mm -hmm. ahead. You can see beyond this sentence. You can see maybe into the next chapter or even the chapter beyond that. But we, but after that, um, but I admire so much people who actually do plan and and. Um, I think it must be great. <laughs> John John Finnamore has been working with me on Good Omens too, and he is, I think, one of the the funniest, most brilliant, most delightful writers that we have right now. And he's working with him is is amazing. And we drive each other nuts because he is one of those. He's a proper writer, which means that as far as he's concerned, you need to figure out the end, <laughs> and then once you've got your end you can work backwards and plant all the things. And I'm like, no, 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 you just, you go through and you plant things. And then once you planted them all, you you have an end and it's there and it's waiting for you and it's obvious. And uh, it, it's, it's, a, it, yeah. it's wonderful, but it, we do have such completely different ways of working. And, and I'm like, surely when you find out what the end is, what's the point of writing it? Is, it the joy of writing is you I, I, I quite often know the last sentence or something about the last with Piranesi I knew the last scene for a long time and I thought oh this is this is but how I was going to get there I had no idea um and so sometimes I know a bit about the um the end um but no I Beyond that, it's just a vague shape. But sometimes with writers who plant things and think this will be useful later on and this will sort of turn into something, occasionally when you're reading them, you can see something they've planted that they found out they didn't. You think, oh, yes, they thought that was going to turn into a bit of plot, but actually they haven't needed it. Sort of oh, I do, that it with, sitting there. I do that with Dickens all the time, rereading Dickens, speaking as somebody, especially because I made Sandman. And when you were, I was making Sandman, 
you you have you're writing that month's installment yes and you have yes. ideas about things you'll do in the future but you know i got to actually experience that thing over a period of about six years which means for me now reading dickens i'll go that's part of the plot that's part of the plot and you've got your you're, 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 you're hiding that because you think you're going to reveal it that's just a ball that you've tossed in the air hoping that you may need something that's something that you wrote because you needed a buffer between two bits that you knew what you were doing that's going to come in incredibly useful because you're actually going to need a character and you're borrowing that character and that's a bit where you thought you were going to be going back to that character and that thing and that happening and now you've actually you you never got there again um, you should you should write about dickens because i mean all the people who write about him very few of them have that experience of having to write a monthly thing so they don't know they can't see that the way you can it's a very unique uh, perspective on it i think it's very it's, interesting it's, it's it, it is it is very odd and very personal and um you know, there are just these moments where you go, oh, you were going there. You had a plot. It would have taken, or you had an idea and you thought you were going back to that. And uh, and sometimes I, it, it's, I, you're right, I should do something about this. I, it's like in, in, in Pickwick Papers, yeah. where there is a ghostly, shadowy plot that never actually lands, that's almost a horror plot. Um, and you can see it going there. There's a meeting on a bridge. There, and there's a moment at the end where he sort of doffs his hat. You can see him finally going, oh, I finished this book and I never got to do that. And one character says to Mr. Pickwick, ah, oh, no, we were, we was very bad people. And you go, ah, oh, that was, that's where you're, you're simply acknowledging that you had a really scary plot here that you never actually went to because the story yeah. went somewhere else. And that's yeah. fine. Yeah. We have, we, we better get to questions because we have 99 plus questions. The, the, obviously the Q&A only holds, uh, counts up to 99 and then it stops. Um, so whoever you are out there, your question will not be got to because we have so many, but I'm gonna try and get to a few. Uh, Sarah Latovsky asks, this is a question for both Susanna and Neil. As an artist, it can be very hard not to immediately hate your own art as soon as you've created it, whether you're a painter, writer, sculptor, do you have that impulse? What do you do to combat that feeling so you can stay within the world of the work in order to finish the project instead of abandoning it? I think, I think probably at this stage, I'm quite good at holding on to whatever it was that made me want to write about this in the first place it's it's that sort of picking up something from the landscape of your mind and thinking this this has roots this goes down deep and the bits that you've written about that you don't like okay that's not right we can jettison we just keep keep going and I think it's it sort of helps that I do this is one way that my peculiar way of working does help with that I write the really the bits that that grab me these sequences it it doesn't help because I've then got to fit them all together but at least those bits those bits are somehow meaningful to me or I wouldn't have put them down and they sort of I think they probably anchor me to the project um even though they make it really difficult to sort of then write the, the thing as a complete thing. But thank you, Sarah. That's a, that's a good question. Your, your take on it, Neil. I, um, with luck, by the time I start to hate something, I'm, I'm on the next thing. And I'm convinced that this time maybe I'll get it right. So I'm, 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 I am a firm believer that art is never really finished. It's just abandoned. Um, and every now and again, you, you make something or I'll make something like, oh, you're, you're lovely. You're, you're exactly what I wanted you to be somehow. Um, 
but even by the point that people are seeing it, it's it's already, um, you know, it, it's it's kind of it feels a little bit historical. Things go out into the world and they get a life of their own. Um, when Piranesi went out into the world, I missed him because he's just such a lovely character, I think. Strange and Norrell, I was glad they were gone. I was sort of like, <laughs> I thought they would never leave. Um, I still feel fond of them, but I don't, I don't miss them like I miss Piranesi. I bet. It, it is funny, the characters who you would love to share your home with, yeah. And the characters who are rather like house guests, where you do find yourself checking your watch and, and saying, you know, we will be needing that spare room very, very soon. Yes, we, we, my, it's been a while that you've been here. Uh, so um, it seems like both Neil and Susanna gained fame on quite long works and have proceeded into mostly shorter stuff in more recent years. Are arduous, lengthy novels and comics a young person's game? Um, well, I think for me, the fact that um, Piranesi was so short, it's just dictated by the story, really. It was, it was a different sort of scale of story. It was a, a small thing. There are very few characters and a very particular story that needed to be told. So um, what I hope I will be able to write next will be longer than Piranesi. Hopefully not as long as Jonathan Strange and Mr. Norrell, but longer than Piranesi. I love long things. I love long things. It's just it takes energy to write them and time. I have never, re weirdly, I mean, because Sandman is altogether about 3,000 pages. Um, I've never actually written anything except possibly American Gods, where I went, I'm setting out to write something long. And now I just have to keep going until it's done. Um, because with, with Sandman, I was always writing a 24 page installment. Yeah, um, yeah. You which, didn't write which, 3000 pages at once. No, and I didn't write 3000 pages and then send them out into the world. I was writing my 24 pages. Um, it was weird for me writing American Gods where nobody except me knew what I was doing and it could have been a bit mad. But honestly, it doesn't feel like a young person's game. It just feels like what you're doing, you know, the work expands to take up the same amount of time. So I, there's definitely a part of me that if I had a time machine, I would nip back to March, 2020 and say, young Neil of March, 2020, um, would you mind just phoning all of the people who you're writing television for and all of these giant projects, which are great fun, and just close them all down until the world reopens? Don't worry, I, I, it'll be a while um, and you can become a novelist and life would have been a lot easier mm. for the last 18 plus months because I wouldn't have been... If, if nothing else, I wouldn't have had to get up at five o'clock in the morning or still be on Zoom calls at midnight, um, communicating with people around the world and making enormous things happen. Um, and trying to collaborate across the world is, is really hard. Um, and I would have just done my day's word count that day and I would have loved that world. Um, but that, it just would have been easier. But I, I think I can absolutely, you know, the, the book I'm on right now is a is a big book. It just keeps getting, I'll write some of it, and then things that people need yesterday turn up. And so the book gets put to one side, and I, I write the stuff they needed yesterday. Let's do another question. Um, for Susanna. Do you enjoy the task and process of writing or is it a difficult labor? Uh, 
I think, um, I think for, well, when it's, it's a really boring answer, but when it's going well, it's wonderful. And when, um, th there's a time in both books where a character turned up and they were completely different characters. And these characters just said, it was like they said to me, sit down, have a cup of tea, don't worry, I've got this. And they just wrote dialogue themselves. In Strange and Norrell, it was Childermas. Any scene with Childermas was just, would just kind of write itself. He just knew what he needed to do. And that was wonderful. And he's a lovely character. He's my one of my favorite characters. In Piranesi, it was different. It was Lawrence on sales. He's not a likable character at all, but he just, that, the scene where he is, that dialogue just wrote itself. It just was so easy. It was just like, I could, he was such a strong personality and it just, and those things are fun because then you, you get, it's almost like reading. Uh, there's little bits where it's almost like being a reader and you're just reading something except it's appearing in front of you but those times are very rare um, so when it's when it's struggling to make bits of the plot fit together no it's a bit less fun really. I, I definitely feel like the times that you get to be the first reader pay for everything um, because you remember it, it's actually like it's like those moments where you get to fly in dreams yeah. and you really do. Oh, that's how you fly. And look at me. I'm just being the first reader of this. The words are coming out of my fingers and I didn't even know this stuff was in my yeah. brain. And now it's here and look at this. And then you expect that to happen the following morning. The next morning and it's just. And now nothing. you have to walk again. <laughs> Somebody says, fascinating as this reminiscing is, would actually love to hear about Piranesi. We hope that you have in ways oblique and interesting. What's it like to hear an actor take your words and create an audio book? Well, the, right, uh, the actor who read Piranesi is Chiwetel Ojiofo, and it was just extraordinary. I, I think I... I, I sort of somebody sent it to me when he'd finished it and I started listening just thinking I would listen to a bit and then come back to it and I, I think I ended up sort of cancelling the next day's activities well I didn't mean to but I just had to go back and I had to listen to it all the way through because the, it was so beautiful um it's not always exactly how you hear the character in your head but I think that's fine. I like to hear somebody do do it differently. I think it, I think it makes it come alive, and it is a bit more like being part of the audience as well. For me, um, mostly, I, I do my own audiobooks, so I I cheat, and I don't get to hear an actor doing an audiobook. I just get to hear me. Um, and that way I know that the characters are probably gonna be kind of like they were in my head and the sentence yeah. with luck will be said as it was in my head. On the other hand, my favorite of all of my audiobooks is Lenny Henry doing Anansi Boys, um, where I sort of written it with Lenny in mind in the beginning and written it to, uh, you know, there were Lenny audiobooks playing and Lenny stand-up routines rather, playing while I wrote it, just getting the rhythms of, of speech. Um, and so it was it was a delight. It is, it is like, I mean, I think with all of these things, it's like getting to visit, getting to walk around a house that you've designed as an architect and that you got to be the only person who ever lived there in your head, but now you're visiting it as, as a newcomer. Um, and sometimes you actually get to sort of look up and go, I, I never thought that the light coming in at that angle would be so, so wonderful. Or you get to laugh at your own jokes, which is special uh, when they take you by surprise. Um, 
the we're running up to the final sort of round of questions so um oh what a great question i admire you both immensely for being at the opposite ends of the same spectrum mr gaiman for his prolificity and the playful exploration of his short stories that seems free from the weight of a novel and Ms. Clark for perhaps being the only person on the planet who makes perfectionism look good and totally worth it all. How do you both decide when to keep refining and when to stop and put things out there? I, I don't know if this will make sense, but I sort of know when to stop. Um, I kind of, I keep going, refining and refining, and then I, but I do actually know when it's, I can, okay, well, this is as good as it's going to be. I can walk away from it now. I, I don't know. I've never tried to analyse how I, what's going on at that point. Um, but I am able to do it. That's that's not really an explanation, but it's, it's all I've got. Um, yeah. For me, it's always just, is the next thing that you've got to get on with. And so you have, there, there'll come a point where you, you know, the phrase it's good enough for jazz is in there somewhere. And there's also that point where you know that if you, you can keep working on something, but maybe it's better just to go, I'll get it right next time. And just keep moving. And sometimes you'll look back and realize that you did get it right at that point. Um, a lot of the time, you got it right. You just, you just had to walk away and move on. A lot of people want to know if Piranesi will be happening on television or on, as a film. That's... I have no information on this point, I'm afraid. So, um, yes, I'd like to know that too. <laughs> there we go. And as we... Oh, lots of people are asking, what was the line from your younger years you managed to include in the final cut of Piranesi? Um, it was, it, it's, uh, it was, it's a description of some spray as, as one of the oceans is pouring into a room. There's some spray that comes through a doorway. And uh, he says it's as if a barrel full of diamonds have been thrown into the room. And that was, it was just that, that I managed to get in. Yeah. I love the idea that somewhere inside you, 24 year old you, is incredibly happy that her line got in. Yeah. Yeah. I think, I hope so. I hope so. I think we all have younger versions of ourselves, sometimes quite difficult to get in touch with, but they're there. Um, and it's good to make them happy. Absolutely. That's, I mean, that was how I felt watching. Um, watching Morpheus meeting Hob every hundred years. And that was my dialogue, my, my thing. And knowing that when I wrote it, aged, what was I, 27, maybe 28, I was already being kind to a 12 or 13 year old version of me who just had this idea that two people would meet in a pub every hundred years and didn't have a plot or anything, but just had this idea and I'd do that. And that there was a 12 or 13 year old version of me who got to be happy from that. And then it, it's, it's nice. We, 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 we gift back to and borrow from ourselves. Um, and a, I think we're at final question time now before Daisy jumps in and takes over. So a um, lot, of, lot of people are asking about C.S. Lewis mm -hmm. and Narnia and Piranesi and the magician's nephew. It's a, questions like that are coming up. Either there's a determined band of people planting it, their thing, or, or, or a lot of people all around the world are it's, um, I think I realized, it wasn't obvious to me, the, the, the original sort of source of Piranesi was the stories of 
of Borges, the Argentin, the blind Argentinian, uh, Argentinian writer, because that he created these very strange worlds, like one was just a library, and and he talked about labyrinths and things. But then I realized that there was this sort of part which I seem to have borrowed from The Magician's Nephew, which is a favorite, favorite book, even among the Narnia books. Um, because anything with the magician in the in the title was bound to get me. And the magician in that book isn't a very nice magician. And I realized that there were echoes of that in Piranesi. So I started then to kind of make them more explicit and it just kind of worked. Um, so I just liked the idea of having this sort of link back to a very, very favorite book. I think it, it is a lovely thing to be able to point to books and works that one has loved and go, I am making something new and maybe I will, for some people who have re read this, there will be echoes. And for people who haven't, perhaps I will send them. Yeah, it's, and it, these, all of our work is created out of the things that we've read, usually as children, that's what you make it out of. And so it's just making that a bit more explicit in, in many ways. I think that really is how it works. So we're at final things before Daisy appears, I believe, and, and just sort of cuts us off. Um, is there gonna be, are you working on anything new? That I am working on something new. Um, I haven't got a snappy way of describing it. It's a book set mostly in Bradford in West Yorkshire, partly in Italy. Who doesn't want to read books about Bradford? So, it, um, and it, it sort of continues um, a little bit the themes of Piranesi. So uh, the themes of being in the world and finding the joy in the world, I think. Um, this is what I'm hoping, anyway. Hi, Daisy. Hi. Thank you both so much. Um, Neil, I don't want to cut you off. Um, and it was just been the most extraordinary and brilliant uh, tour through Piranesi and through so many fantastic worlds and the imagination of two of our greatest um, literary creators. So thank you both so, so much. And I'm sorry that we're running towards the end of the time because there've been so many fantastic questions, more than 150 questions, which is record breaking for five by 15. Neil, thank you so much for, for um, curating that conversation so beautifully and um, for sharing so much about your connection to each other and your process and how these incredible worlds are brought to life. It has been a huge privilege and honor for us to be able to host this this evening. And thank you, Susanna, so much for being with us. Um, but for now, it's time for us to say goodbye. I don't know if you have any final words, Neil. Um, thank you for getting up so early in New Zealand. Thank you. <laughs> We're oh, so thank honored. you. <laughs> thank that you. was a delight. And Susanna, give my love to Colin. I will. I will. I will. Good night. Thank you all.